I never cared for my name, Clive Staples. The world came to know me as C.S. Lewis. Perhaps you read my books. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is the most famous, but there's one story that's not so well known. It's my story. What would it be like to spend an evening with famed writer C.S. Lewis? On today's show, we're going to talk with actor Max McLean, who is behind a new movie that will give you an opportunity to experience Lewis as never before. I'm John West, Managing Director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. Thank you for joining us today. C.S. Lewis has to be one of the most beloved authors in the English language. At least he's one of my favorite authors. His works have spanned many genres, from children's books to academic books to theology, even science fiction. As some of you may know, I edited both an encyclopedia about Lewis and a book of essays titled The Magician's Twin that explores Lewis's views on science, scientism, and society. Among many other things, Lewis was a prophetic critic of authoritarian science and the misuse of science to attack human dignity and ethics. Now, Lewis died in 1963, but you couldn't tell that by the continuing interest in his life and work. I am delighted to have on our show today actor Max McLean, who has a new film out on Lewis that will be in theaters for one night and one night only on Wednesday, November 3rd. The film is called The Most Reluctant Convert, the untold story of C.S. Lewis. Max is an award-winning actor and the founder and artistic director of the New York City-based Fellowship for Performing Arts, which produces theater and film from a Christian worldview, but for audiences of all beliefs. Max, welcome to our show. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you. Great. And you're from speaking from New York City right now? I am. I am. Great. That's where uh, my apartment is and where our offices are. I actually love New York City, but the last time I've been there was like two or three years ago with my wife, maybe 2018. It's a wonderful city, especially for someone on the West Coast. It's just a different feel, more international, lots of history, lots of bustle. Anyway, um, I've had an opportunity to preview your film, and the, my bottom line, uh, I'll give it uh, top, is I think it's fabulous. Uh, I know it was based on your one-man stage show, but you've done, I think, a wonderful job in creating a beautifully cinematic film, which can be hard to do in, in doing the ad adaptation. At the same time, it remains really intimate and personal, and I think your portrayal of the older Lewis and Nicholas Ralph's portrayal of the young adult Lewis will really make audiences feel like they've spent an evening one-on-one -on -one with Lewis. So can you tell us the story of how your play and then film came to be, and then maybe also explain the film's subtitle, The Untold Story of right. C.S. Lewis? Well, let me start with The Untold Story, because uh, it's uh, certainly his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, tells his story, but it's not one of his better-known works. Uh, and, uh, and of course, when you talk about mm. film, uh, the story of Lewis's conversion from hard-boiled atheist, vigorous debunker of Christianity, to becoming, as he said, uh, you know, he finally uh, gave in and admitted that God is God, uh, knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected, reluctant convert in all England. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the story that we're telling, and that story is not well known outside, of course, of uh, Lewis scholars who know everything uh, quite well. So that's the untold story in terms of how uh, how the play came about and how the film came about. Well, we've done uh, theatrical adaptations of Lewis before. We've done the Screw Tape Letters. We've done the Great Divorce, uh, and both Screw Tape and Great Divorce are very personal to Lewis. Uh, they're both about spiritual warfare. Uh, screw tape, of course, uh, spiritual warfare from a demonic uh, point of view, uh, uh, how uh, temptation uh, hinders our walk or hinders our desire to move forward in Christ. And uh, the great divorce is from the opposite, opposite perspective of how we resist the Holy Spirit. But uh, And they tell fantastical tales uh, to get to the point. And both being very, very personal to Lewis because, you know, he was being transparent uh, about his own uh, flaws uh, in in his walk with Christ. And, and uh, that, uh, and they both relate to uh, what prevented him from moving forward 
uh, in Christ. Uh, you know, he said he knelt and prayed and gave in. He thought his life was going to be over once he became a Christian, uh, right? He didn't think, okay, you know, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> no. You know, he had no idea what, what the Lord had in mind. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, I went back to his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, which I mentioned earlier, to get back to the root of uh, Lewis's own story. Uh, and that led to uh, the play version, uh, which, which was very popular. We ran for 15 weeks in New York, uh, toured uh, all over the country, uh, and doing lots of colleges and universities, of course, until the pandemic shut us down. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, when the pandemic shut us down, uh, I had already been in conversation with uh, my good friend Norman Stone, who's a, a well-known uh, director, uh, has several Emmys, a couple of BAFTA awards, which is a British equivalent to Oscars, to his credit, uh, about uh, making a film version of the play. And uh, but when 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 it shut down, you know, everything shut down. We had, you know, we had three plays on the road and a play here in New York. And uh, we said, what are we going to do? Um, and uh, Norman said, well, you know, uh, ba back in June of 20, uh, when we knew we were in for a long term shutdown, um, he said, you know, the British uh, uh, film is going to reopen in August under very strict guidelines. But if you're willing to act, we can move forward, and I can get a really good crew and and good uh, a, a good cast at very uh, reasonable competitive rates. If we're willing to move quickly, I says, well, if you would confirm that and confirm that the locations were available, I would go to my board and see if we can get the funding and get the film in the can, and we can talk about post production and. Uh, and distribution later. Uh, so that all happened. We got the rights to C.S. Lewis Estate uh, in the last some, sometime in August. Uh, I boarded a, a plane as big as Air Force One for London with fewer people on it. Went to London and quarantined for a couple of weeks. Began filming in the middle of September and uh, finished the middle of October. And here we are a year later and we're about ready to release the film. That's amazing. So um, it's, it's nice to hear a, a, a good COVID story of actually <laughs> COVID uh, providing an additional opportunity to get a project like this off the ground. Um, as you just noted, you've done a number of stage plays on C.S. Lewis. <laughs> so how did you first become interested in him in the first place? Well, uh, I'm an adult convert to Christianity, and okay. and, uh, and I, I think of Lewis, and I think you would appreciate this, I think of Lewis as kind of a bridge mm. uh, for you know, from postmodern thought to historic Orthodox Christianity, particularly for our postmodern age, because that's what we—that's basically what we come with. You know, this this postmodern worldview, uh, where we're really focused on the here and now, and uh, and Lewis, of course, speaks eloquently about this the other world, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, his genius is he captures your imagination. He says. Uh, Reason is the, uh, he said, the imagination is the organ of meaning. Reason is the organ of truth. And I think what he meant by that is the imagination serves up the raw material of what we think about. And, and if an idea doesn't uh, capture the imagination, it's, you're, you're just not going to invest the effort required to, uh, you know, to go into the truth factor to about that, uh, that, that uh, produces uh, evaluation and change. So Lewis has been a, a, a hero of mine. He's become my spiritual guide. Uh, I think he's uh, not just one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, but one of the greatest writers of all time. I mean, the constellation of ideas that come from him uh, are you find nowhere else. So, uh, and I thought it could be captured theatrically. Um, wow. In fact, uh, uh, the idea of our first play, Screw Tape, uh, the idea came to me, a theater professor from uh, Drew University in, in New Jersey, uh, saw one of our other plays and said, you know, uh, I think you would make a really good screw tape. And I didn't know if that was a compliment or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I was intrigued. Uh, he had an idea how to do it. And I said, well, if we get the rights with C.S. Lewis Estate, we'd have a go. And that was back about 20 years ago. So I, I would say for the last 20 years, and, and of course, whenever you're going to try to adapt uh, a, a, a book from the page to the stage, you really have to get underneath it and, and understand uh, all the nooks and crannies behind it. So uh, uh, that's even forced me to go deeper into Lewis 
And one thing almost anybody that, that discovers Lewis finds, you never get to the bottom of it. No. There's always no. more there. So what's your favorite Lewis book? Well, that's hard to say because, uh, you know, uh, he, I would say the screw tape letters was very impactful mm -hmm. as was the great divorce. I think the great divorce is a, it was peeling an onion a little bit. It didn't come, it didn't hit me right away, but when it did, it hit pretty hard because it really goes to show how much we mm -hmm. resist the promptings of our conscience, the promptings of the Holy spirit, uh, and, uh, and how much we have to fight, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, he talks about, uh, uh, easy things go, uh, downstream, hard things go upstream. You have to really fight to bring things upstream. Uh, so uh, that's what uh, Lewis has really uh, inspired me to to do more than I would do otherwise. Okay, great. Um, yeah. You're we're going to talk a little bit about some specific uh, parts of your film. Um, mm -hmm. Your film spends some time on Lewis's rocky relationship with his dad. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to compliment you on that. This is a little pet peeve of mine. Uh, sometimes people writing about Lewis's father portray him as such an unsympathetic character that I actually think it's unfair. Um, I think you give a little more nuanced portrayal of his dad and how he did love his family. And I also love to see uh, that you have the older Lewis expressing regret about the relationship with his father, which I also think is true. Why did you think portraying Lewis's relationship with his father, Albert, was so important? Well, I do think that that was, uh, there was, I think there were three key events that contributed to Lewis's anti-theism. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, would, first, of course, the death of his mother mm -hmm. uh, at age nine to cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, he prayed. Prayer doesn't work. You know, I was used to things not working, thought no more about it. Uh, then, of course, as you mentioned, the, the, he had a very challenging relation with his dad. His dad was overbearing. Um, and, of course, his, uh, his picture of God was related to, to his dad. Uh, and... Uh, and then, of course, the third thing was, uh, you know, he, he experienced the butchery of World War One, the Great War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he came to the conclusion after that, that either there's no God behind the universe, a God indifferent to good and evil, or worse, an evil God. Uh, and that's kind of the starting point of our film. So I did feel like the, the dad and, and Richard Harrington does a marvelous job mm -hmm. uh, with the father. So does Amy Alexander's Flora Lewis. Um, mm -hmm. And you get a picture of, you know, she made the happy home. Um, but uh, you get the picture of, of, of that. And, and of course, when she died, he said all settled happiness oh. was over. It, you know, he said his, uh, you know, it, it was all sea and islands now. The island, it was like Atlantis had sunk. It was oh. all sea and islands now. He had, he had no security, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and his dad didn't help him in that way. Yeah. And, of course, he shipped him off two weeks later to a horrible boarding school. That's true. All of these things contributed to the Lewis that wrote all the marvelous stuff that he wrote. He did. I do want to say that I think there is actually an even more of a sympathetic side to Lewis's father than even than what you showed. And I don't fault you for what you showed. I think you were exactly faithful to Lewis's recollections in Surprise by Joy. But I don't know if you know this, you probably do, uh, but Lewis's brother Warren wrote a lengthy biography of his brother, most of which was never published. They published a slice of it. I've heard a rumor, actually more than a rumor, that the Lewis estate finally and Wade Center finally gave permission for someone to um, bring it out. I hope they do. I had tried to get that myself from them for years and was sort of put off. But I'd say... Warren, uh, I've had a chance to read it at the Wade Center, presents a far more sympathetic view of their dad. In particular, he reprints a lot of letters their dad wrote to his sons while they were away at school, including letters after their mother's death that I think really, and there's also some evidence from Lewis's letters and from Warren from his biography that both he and his brother did after they became Christians really regret how badly they treated their dad because not only did they ridicule him, they, they did a lot of things. And uh, for me, that regret, which you which you note, shows just how Lewis and his brothers growing maturity as Christians. And I just think it's a powerful story of repentance. And maybe this relationship between the Lewis sons and their dad should be the subject of a stage play someday. Well, hint, I do hint. think I think I appreciate what you're saying about Lewis absolutely regretted his relationship with his father, and his dad did write, you know, even in collected letters, some of the letters that uh, that he wrote to Lewis, 
Uh, in fact, there was a wonderful story. I can't remember the fellow's name. Uh, somebody that Lewis uh, did not respect at all, uh, a, a student or a colleague at Oxford. Uh, he went off to visit him and his father. And, and the way this man, who Lewis did not respect, the way he treated his father, uh, who was an older man mm. and, and very feeble, uh, really shamed Lewis. Yeah. Uh, so Lewis really, uh, you know, I, I think one of the one of the great things, you know, he was a, he was a big person. Lewis was so was his dad, and and one of the things that you know Christianity did to him is it humbled him, and and he yeah. he absolutely, you know, he did not let himself off the hook, as it yeah. were. You know, we yeah. tend to do that, and he did. Yeah, I think that's powerful. So. Another strand running through your film, it seems to me, is Lewis's relationship with science, which is going to be of interest to many in our audience. Your film starts out with Lewis as an outspoken scientific atheist for whom science reinforces sort of his bleak materialist worldview. <laughs> you also have Lewis give what he sometimes called his argument from undesigned, you know, just how much pain and evil in the universe that, you know, if there's a God, it must be awful. Um, and, and now I love how you have Lewis at one point walking through the Natural History Museum with the statue of Darwin watching over him. But then you flip it later and you show how Lewis came to ultimately believe that there must be something more. Key in that is a debate over the origins of reason. And I'm thinking now the scene you have, the wonderful scene with Lewis and his friend Owen Barfield. You have Lewis asserting that natural selection, random mutation produced human reason and then being convinced by his friend otherwise. So I wonder if you could share why you made this debate over reason really central. Uh, well, I think it was a big move for Lewis. I do. You know, it, it moved him from the atheistic camp to what he calls idealism. Yep. You know, that uh, there was uh, something out there that was unknowable. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing to obey, nothing to believe. Just, but, but it was. Uh, I, 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 there's a there's a line he says. It would never come down here and do anything. <laughs> so yeah. that, that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, that was a, a big part. But I, I think that was the first step. It was uh, maybe the first pawn or the first uh, bishop that uh, was mm -hmm. lost in Lewis's. Uh, case against God, yeah. and then of course later on, you know, he he makes that that extraordinary. Uh, I think it's wonderful. He said his argument against God was that the universe was so cruel and unjust. But where has he got this notion of cruel and unjust? Yes. He calls yeah. a line crooked because he has some idea of a straight line. What was yeah. he comparing the universe with when he called it cruel and unjust? Yeah. And and I think that's almost unanswerable. Uh, you yep. know, and. Uh, uh, of course, the you know because the answer is not uh, 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 desired, then you know it's like what he says. To, what Lucy uh, uh, is it Lucy or Polly? Polly says yeah. in in uh, that I'll, I must find another stream, and you know Aslan said there is no other stream. Yeah, I just want to encourage those who are watching, who are particularly interested in, in debates over science, design, other things. Is that you know th this story tells Lewis's story from. You know, atheism to Christian, but a key part of it is this sort of science subtext, and it's a great going to be a great discussion starter for you and your friends. Uh, and it's a fun film; that's why you should go see it. But it's also on some of these issues of sort of scientific atheism, the argument from reason, the argument from morality. Uh, this, like I said, you can discuss with your non-Christian friends, with uh, uh, your family members. I mean, it will be a great. You'll want to have lots of discussions. Plan after you go to the movie to you know go if you're allowed where you're living. To a restaurant or something, you know, for to have coffee or, or something to have a discussion or have people over to your home because it's a great discussion starter. I don't know if, oh, I don't no, know. No, it's fine. I, I just was going to mention that uh, we, we've actually, uh, we've had our friend Devin Brown, professor of English at Asbury College, produce a study guide based on the film. And oh, that's wow. available, uh, that's available at, uh, on our website, cslewismovie.com. There's a resource page. Fantastic. Uh, that has it. So yeah, just okay. follow we'll, we'll, we'll link we'll link to that. I hadn't seen yeah. it on the page. So I don't know if you knew, but Charles Darwin himself actually expressed doubts about how much we could trust our reason if we adopted a Darwinian explanation for how it came to be. And in a let in a letter he wrote in eighteen eighty one that was reprinted in his autobiography, Darwin wrote that with me the horrid doubt always arises 
whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, uh, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? And the reason I cite that is because C.S. Lewis owned a copy of Darwin's autobiography in his personal library. And in Lewis's copy, this very passage is underlined. And you can see it actually at the Wade Center in Wheaton College, which holds part of Lewis's personal library. And I think I was the first one who actually reported on this in The Magician's Twin when I found out about it, had a researcher go and transcribe stuff for me. But so Lewis, on the argument for reason, he, he actually read this doubt in Darwin, underlined it. And you know, I don't, I'm not saying that that caused Lewis this thing. He had, you know, the, the debates with Owen Barfield and things, but I think he found it interesting that Darwin himself struggled with mm -hmm. that. How do you account for reason? Mm -hmm. So what do you personally hope that people will take away from your film? Very much what we've just been talking about. You know, I mentioned very early on in our conversation about Lewis being this bridge from postmodernism back to orthodox christianity and and the idea of another world in fact he, you know one of the things we haven't talked about is the you know the dialectic of desire you know if i find yeah. myself a uh, a desire in which uh, no experience in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. And he says, he says he didn't think that these, uh, that earthly desires will ever satisfy them, but only to arouse them to suggest mm -hmm. the real thing. And, and uh, later, you know, what moved him in his the ministry part of his life after his conversion was to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. So I, I do think this will be a first step. I, I think it's needed. Uh, you know, the work that you do, uh, you know, there's there's lots of uh, what well, Jesus said, it, I mean, Jesus said it, uh, Lewis said it, and I don't <laughs> normally confuse them. I just want yeah, you to sure. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. uh, but Lewis one time said, you know, I, I, I have, a, uh, you know, I have this, uh, unbearable intellectualism you know that he like he can't help himself he said you know of course the the direct evangelical appeal come to jesus is still very effective i've seen it done he says uh and and those who uh, you know i can't do it but those who can ought to do it with all their might uh so uh, you know so that's you know lewis does not uh eliminate that by any means but one of the things that he does say that i really believe he said that he doesn't think that rational arguments uh, create belief, but he says the lack of them destroys conviction. I mean, destroys yeah. them uh, because if you're not willing to defend it, it just ultimately goes away. And that's exactly what I'm finding on college campuses. It's not that yeah. Christianity is is considered nefarious. It's just it's just irrelevant. Yeah. It's just not defended, not discussed. I think, and so I, I hope this film is able to be a step in that direction. Yeah, I think that's very insightful. Um, our emotions, imaginations are all wonderful and important, but ultimately people want to know what's true. And so they mm -hmm. want, if they don't also aren't able to think through that, uh, that leaves a void. So um, as we wrap up, what are you up to next? Well, we've got, uh, uh, we've got, a tour of C.S. Lewis, The Great Divorce, that's going on right now all over the country. Okay. You can go to greatdivorceonstage.com. See, okay. I think uh, by the time this airs, it'll probably be in the Grand Rapids, St. Louis, okay. uh, Indianapolis, Cleveland, many other places. Uh, so that's going on. Uh, Norman Stone and I are uh, diligently uh, doing some research on a new piece that I'm not ready to, I can't divulge sure, just yet, sure. but we're, uh, we, we, we like doing film and we do see film in our future. Uh, as for me, I'm beginning, I just finished the sequel to The Most Reluctant Convert. Uh, mm. It's, uh, this, this play uh, is, uh, when Lewis, it starts with this premise, when Lewis was converted, it was not obvious to anyone, let alone him, that he would become the kind of person that he became. So what were some of the things that propelled him to become the Lewis that we know now? And so this new play, which I've uh, tentatively titled Further Up, Further In, mm. uh, is going to tell that story, uh, beginning, let's say, uh, what happened to him uh, right after his conversion in 31, you know, mm. he wrote Pilgrim's Regress in two weeks yep. uh, in 32 uh, to talk about his conversion and, uh, you know, uh, his uh, broadcast talks, Problem of Pain, uh, and uh, and just some of the way he he ministers to people in, in his 
in his unique way. Have you ever, just side question, I know we need to wrap up, but um, have you ever read his narrative poem, Dimer? I have not read it. I, of course, I know it. Be, be, because um, I, I know of it. I because, because I would say that if you, as you're casting about in future years, and if you think of a future project, uh, Dimer is really interesting because it, it's before he was a Christian, but after he was no longer materialist. So it's when he's an idealist. And it's a, and you probably you wouldn't want to do it in the in the narrative verse, but even as a story of this young man, part of this scientific totalitarian state, and then he escapes it, and then he goes through various misadventures, uh, including some things I think really are Lewis's critique of postmodernism. There's a, a chapter, and there's so much in that book that actually prefigures his writings as Christians, including the first mention of the term Shadowlands, which didn't occur in Narnia. It actually occurred in Dimer. So I, and the other good thing, um, I mean, I presume you have a great relationship with the Lewis estate, but Dimer is either in the public domain or as of next year will become in the public domain. So oh, that's the right what, you, what you just described also uh, reminds me of Lewis's, uh, what Lewis was trying to say from a Christian perspective in that hideous strength. Yes. Uh, so this uh, film that you're doing now, uh, The yeah. Most Reluctant Convert, is in theaters for one night only, Wednesday, November 3rd. How do people get tickets? CSLewisMovie.com. CSLewisMovie.com. Uh, it'll take you to the page you put in your zip code, or it probably knows where you are. Put in your zip code, and it'll tell you the theaters nearest you. Uh, the tickets, I'm, I'm happy to say, are, are, are going fast. Uh, the movie change who we work with, AMC, Regal, Cinemark, uh, kind of put us on a prove-it deal. And uh, they've been adding uh, many shows, and, and uh, there may even be an encore. So we'll keep it right. on. I would encourage them, if there's any way, to add some more in Washington State, because most of your ones are in Seattle. And like a week before it shows, they're adding vaccine passports for the first time. And we don't know what impact that will have, because even people who have vaccines don't often like to prove it. And so um, most all of your theaters are in the county that uh, in, in my state where, like I said, shortly before th this comes down, it will be harder to go to things. Whereas some of the other things like in Tacoma, which is our second largest city, there's nothing in the adjoining you know, counties that where it's a lot going to be a lot freer. But um, well, that's a good that's a good note. Let me uh, let me send an email with that comment and see what happens. Anyway, um, so I also know we and you may not be able to address this, that, but we'll get this question. And so I'll ha uh, from our audience members here and abroad, if they don't have a theater nearby or they're from in England or some other country and can't see it November 3rd, are, are there future plans to make it available in other ways? Well, we just open up and this is not we. I mean, this is really uh, beyond me, uh, you know, the, the distribution partners, the movie chains. We just opened up 43 theaters in Canada. Uh, and uh, uh, and I do think because it is selling well th that, you know, after November 3rd, it, in some ways I'm contractually obligated not to talk too much about anything sure. beyond that. But uh, because it's selling well, I do anticipate that there will be a worldwide release following uh, yeah. it. Will what it does in New York, uh, right. in not just New York, in no, the United all States. Around yeah. Yeah. So great. So we've been talking with actor Max McLean about his wonderful new film, The Reluctant Convert. You can get more information about it and tickets uh, about at cslewismovie.com. Uh, and you can see it right now in theaters for one night only, November 3rd. And I'd really encourage you to go. Take your friends. Great discussion starter for some of Lewis's ideas, including the argument over the origin of reason. Now, I'd also say as we wrap up, if you're interested in digging deeper into Lewis's views on science, materialism, Darwinism, and more specifically, I'd also encourage you to go to cslewisweb.com, which is a Discovery Institute site. That's cslewisweb.com. It features some of my work, including some essays, information about the book, The Magician's Twin, and three documentaries we've done about Lewis that actually collectively have had close to a million views on YouTube on sort of scientism, evolution, intelligent design. That's cslewisweb.com. For ID the future. This is John West. Thank you for being with us today, and I hope you come back. I never cared for my name, Clive Staples. The world came to know me as C.S. Lewis. Perhaps you read my books. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the most famous, but there's one story that's not so well known. It's my story.